it just wasn't really a way to divide it up into two two lectures because uh, it's all tied in with uh, syllabification. So let me uh, go ahead and open us with a word of prayer, and uh, then we will get started. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this evening. We thank you just for the opportunity that we have to gather uh, to study your word and to learn this language. Pray, Lord, you bless our time, that you'd allow us to be able to focus. And all we say and do, honor and glorify you, for it's in your name we pray. Amen. All right. Uh, so we talked about a uh, number of different things on this particular uh, lecture. Um, one of them was syllables. Uh, and we talked a little bit about what we call the syllables. Uh, I'm not ever going to test you or quiz you on what we call them. It's just easier in terms of when we're talking about a syllable uh, for us to be able to refer to them by the classification of syllable, just that you know which syllable I'm talking about. So we have the tonic, the pretonic, post-tonic, I suppose, and pre-protonic, which is the one that comes two before. And uh, that'll be significant uh, because in a couple of weeks, we'll be talking about pro-pretonic reduction, uh, which is when a vowel is two spaces away from the accent, it will reduce to a vocal schwa, uh, which is why that's significant. So at least when we get to that in a couple of weeks, you'll know what pro-pretonic means when we talk about that particular syllable. Uh, we also talked about open and closed syllables uh, and the, uh, the importance of open and closed. And really, it comes down to, uh, to understanding why vowels do what vowels do. Hebrew is one of those odd languages in that the vowels are not written in the original text. Uh, they were added in about a thousand years ago by the Masoretes based on the oral tradition that had been handed down over hundreds, thousands of years, um, as best as they understood it. And there's been some tweaking of that over the last thousand years as various editors and manuscripts have been found and uh, kind of understanding exactly how the text works in greater detail. Uh, so the vowels were not there. And yet, because it's a language, and almost every language is like this, the language is dependent upon vowels. Uh, so it's dependent upon the one thing that was not written in the text, which can be a little frustrating of even when you look at the original consonantal text with no vowel pointing in it, the vowels are still the most important thing there. Um, the difference is that you have to know based on the form of just the consonants, what the, what the word is. So for us, we're very fortunate in that uh, and very blessed in that we have vowels actually in the text for us. And basically over the rest of this summer, we are going to be learning what the vowels tell us. Uh, because it's the vowels that are going to be the key to most, uh, most verb identifications. They're going to be the key to uh, noun endings. They're going to be the key to a lot of things. So we have to know what the vowel is. And to some degree, we have to be able to predict why the vowel does what it does. And that's where the open and the closed syllable becomes important of understanding, okay, I see this vowel here, why do I have this vowel here? And not only why do I have this vowel here, but what is the rest of the word doing because this vowel is here? Uh, and so that's the importance of the open and the closed syllable. Um, even something as simple as what we talked about, and it's mentioned briefly in the lecture, the, the comets, which is the long A, and the comets hatuf, which is the short O, and understanding that one shows up in a uh, closed, unaccented syllable, or an open accented syllable, the other one shows up in an unaccented open syllable or a accented closed syllable. And keeping those two straight helps us know, okay, this is a, this is a short O or this is a long A, simply based on an understanding of the syllable. So that's why, that's why we're emphasizing it and that's why it's important uh, to understand and to understand why we have all these dogesh fortes all over the place because the dogesh fortes have a lot to do with syllables. How do I create an extra syllable without actually changing the consonantal text? Uh, and so that's why that's of utmost importance, um, placing that into the, into the word and, uh, and allowing that dot to inform what exactly is going on in the word. There are certain verb forms that we'll come to that are completely dependent upon a dogesh forte. And so recognizing that that's a dogesh forte 
allows us to understand what's going on in the, in the word. Uh, so that said, was there anything specifically in the lecture that stuck out at you that, oh, wait a minute, I didn't really get this, or I have a question about this? There was one mistake in the, uh, in the lecture. If you caught it, I, I called a closed or an open syllable a closed syllable. I even went back and looked at the manuscript that I used to create the videos, and it was correct in my manuscript, and somehow, somehow I said it wrong in the video. So that's been corrected. There is a, a correct version of the lecture up. Now that you've all watched it, uh, I've gone back and, and corrected it, because I know you're all going to want to watch it six, seven, eight times tonight before you go to bed. So it's, uh, it's all set for you. But any questions, anything that? I think I was confused about this. Squinum Levy. Squinum Levy. Yep. Yes, those are uh, things that you come across rarely, but they are sibilants. So anything that starts with an S. Uh, so Samic, Sin, uh, sometimes Shin, uh, Kof, Nun, Mem, Lamed, Vav, and Yod. When there is a vocal schwa, sometimes they will not take the Dagish Forte. Um, so the most famous one, this a little bit so that you guys can see it on the board here that you're going to see all over the place is uh, this phrase. Oops. This is Vaya He, uh, and He Was, and this it shows up everywhere. This is might be the most common verb form other than He Said. Uh, but this shows up all over the Old Testament. But because of the form, we would expect a dagesh forte in the yod here, because we've got the short a under the vav. So if we didn't have the dagesh here, we would assume that this is vaihi, and that this is a silent schwa closing out the syllable of the patak. But instead, simply because we know the form, and the form of this is always, it's always that, where it puts the dagesh in the next syllable, similar to the definite article. We know there should be a dagesh there. And so by working backwards and saying there should be one there, and it isn't, this must be a skinum levy, so it is by ya. And so that's the only time that it ever comes in handy, is recognizing that I've got a short vowel, in a what appears to be a closed syllable with a silent schwa. And so I'm going to pronounce it as one syllable, but then instead recognizing, oh no, it's two syllables because this is a skinum, skinum levy. Uh, so that's where it occasionally comes in, in handy. Um, it's one of those things that, similar to uh, gutturals, um, to ask ourselves, uh, okay, there's something odd going on here, what could it be? And then to run through the categories in our heads of, okay, it could be begad kafat, it could be a guttural, it could be a skinum levy, it could be, it's just kind of one of those bucket categories for when you come across something that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, for whatever reason, my professor never discussed it. So I, it wasn't until uh, I started watching, there's a, a series of, of emails that you can get called Daily Dose of Hebrew, and they will email you a two minute video every day, and they will basically in two minutes, they work through a verse, exegeting the verse. Uh, you can just go to daily, dailydoseofhebrew.org. It's uh, Mike, Mike Frutado, Mark Frutado, down in uh, RTS in Orlando. He's the one that started it. He doesn't do the videos anymore. Uh, but he mentioned Skinum Levy, and I had no idea what, what he was talking about. So I went out, asked my associate pastor, Sean, who has about as much interest in Hebrew as I have in church history. And he knew. He's like, oh, yeah, Skinum Levy, that's this, this, and this. And I had to go look it up because I had no idea what he was talking about. So you can actually make it through Hebrew without ever learning it. So I'm giving it to you at the beginning. So if you come across it, you're like, oh, okay, that's, that's why. That's what it's there for. So just kind of one of those things to tuck in the back of your mind. Anything else? Any other uh, questions that jumped out at you? I have one on the Dagesh Forte. Uh -huh. So you have that, and it's not a 
the guy that that letter. So it's the consonants used twice. Uh huh. So do you pronounce it on both sides, like on the first syllable and the second syllable? So you just you hear it twice? Yeah, sort of. Uh, about as much as we would pronounce the double D in daddy or the, um, the, uh, the double G in baggy or, you know, it's technically it's bag division G or dad division D, but we don't really, we don't really pronounce it that way. It's just daddy. So yeah, it comes out being being a double letter, but you don't always hear it. Any other questions? Okay, great. Well, if you have your workbook, if you want to open up to page, let's see, 13, 12, must be page 11. Exercise, says exercise three at the top. Um, All right, so what we're simply gonna do is we are just gonna go around and divide these words up into syllables, just to do some lovely practice of that. Yeah. <laughs> do you need a pen? Oh, a pencil, I don't know if that's Oh, I do have a pen. <laughs> yes. I'm not a fan of thinking ministries, so it's just a free pen. <laughs> <laughs> I'll use their pens, but yes. Yeah. All right, so the first one is done for us there. Uh, you can see that it's, it's a short vowel of, uh, but the, what's the short vowel under the aleph there? Patak, yep, so that is a short A, yep. And then we have the bait there does not have a dagesh line in it because this is the end of a syllable and dagesh line appears generally at the beginning of a syllable. So every once in a while you'll have ab, but it's usually av with the soft, the soft pronunciation. Um, not always the case, but most of the time, just got your pencil for you. Uh, and then the next syllable there is what's under the resh? Comets, which is a not short, long a. Yes, and because it's a long a, it is its own thing. Uh, it does not have the accent on that syllable. This is not avraham. This is avraham. And so the accent goes onto the last syllable. Um, so because of that, because it has the accent on the last syllable, that is a closed syllable, but what letter is, what vowel is under the hay? A long A, which is a comments, yes. So because it is the accent syllable, even though it is a closed syllable, it will still take the long vowel. So Avraham. Uh, if if the if the resh had the accent of raham, then you would probably have a different vowel in the last syllable. It would probably be something like of rahem with hem instead of ham, but allowing it to have that that long a because of the accent. So number two here, um, we're going to divide this up into syllables. So if I were to divide this up. What would be my first syllable? Where would I divide it first? Uh-huh, after the gimel and the schwa, is this a vocal schwa or a silent schwa? 
Vocal, yes. Rule number B on the A, B, C, D rules that were on the lecture. If it's at the beginning, beginning starts with a B. If it's at the beginning of a word, you always pronounce it. Uh, we do the same in English, accord again. So, G. All right, and then uh, where would the second line be? After the bait, yep. And is that a long vowel or a short vowel under the bait? Mm -hmm. What letter is it? What vowel? Short E? What do we call a short E? Segel. Say raise a long E, but yes, segel. Uh, it is allowed to have a single, uh, to have a, be an open cons or open syllable because it has the accent. And by having the accent, it flips. So normally you would have a short vowel in a closed syllable, but once it has the accent, it can be in an open syllable. Long vowels are in open syllables unless it has the accent, then it switches and then they can be in closed syllables. So just like you have the closed syllable in number one that has a long vowel because it has the accent, here you have a short vowel in an open syllable because it has the accent. So that allows it to, in a sense, violate the rule if you want to call it that. And, uh, and they've got the little, the little carrot symbol that actually does not show up in Hebrew. That's only an English symbol. That's to tell us that that has the accent so that we know this is gaberet and not gaberet. They're, they're telling us that. Yep. <coughs> so, is it right to say every word? If it's having the accent, so it can stay short? Uh, yes, in a sense. Uh, this is a, a I think Gaberit is actually a uh, um, place name, uh, I think. So this would end up being a segolet pattern where you have the two segols after each other. And for whatever reason, when that happens, you often end up with the first one having the accent. Um, typically, I want to say typically, a lot of the times we end up with a long vowel in the first syllable and a short vowel in the second syllable. But with segols, because the accent has moved to the first syllable, you're allowed to have the two short. Um, so it's, it's kind of intrinsic in the form of a segolet to have the, the two there. So we have a div dividing line after the gimel. We have a dividing line after the first bait. And then where's our next dividing line? After the tough, yep. And you don't even have to draw the line there. You can just leave it blank. But we know that we would not have the, the line, the dividing line after the resh, because that either puts the resh and the bait together, but then we have two vowels in the same syllable, and you can't do that. Not to mention the fact that it leaves tav without a vowel, and you also can't have that. So the resh, segel, and tav have to go together at the end, the bait and the segel in the middle because of the accent, and then the gimel uh, with the, uh, the schwa in it. And the gimel you will see there also has a dagesh in it. Is that a dagesh forte? Nope, it's a dagesh line. How do we know that it's a dagesh line? Bagad kafat letter, yes. And why do we typically put a dagesh forte in a letter? To double it, why would we need an extra letter, generally? Close the syllable. Is there a syllable that comes before the gimel? No. So a dagesh forte would do us absolutely no good there. Having two gimels doesn't accomplish anything. Uh, so we know this. Uh, Yes, if it, usually a dagesh line is that case. Um, oftentimes, I don't know if they would ever put a, I suppose you could put a dagesh forte in the first letter, but I, I don't think it's very common. Yeah. It's usually the, um, if the vowel that came, or if the word before ended in a vowel or a kamete, then almost always you will have a dagesh line in the bagad kafat letter, um, just as a as part of that reading. Um, again, that's one of those 
we learn all these rules and then once we start reading, then we realize that there are extra rules that you can't really teach because you need the whole text in order to see them. Um, similar to what we talked about last time, we talked about the pausal form, that word that comes at the end and has the saluk accent on it at the very end of the sentence. But if you put that on a paper by itself, it looks like a metheg, not a saluk, because you don't know it's the end of the sentence because it's just one word. So that's one of those rules you don't really learn until you start reading the text. Some of the Dagesh rules are kind of the same. Um, for one of my classes, we had to, he would give us an English text and we had to write it in Hebrew. And my Dagesh, I mean, they were read all over my paper because putting the two words together affects things and I don't always think in that way. I just think one word at a time. And so he went through and ended up marking all of it. But it's still, he, he would just mark it wrong. He wouldn't tell me why. It took me like three or four lessons before I finally contacted him and said, why do you keep marking all these wrong? And that's when he told me, if, if the previous word ends in a vowel, it affects the, that first letter, especially if it's a big ad kafat letter. Um, okay, the next word there. Where would the syllable line be? Uh, not technically. Mm -hmm. There is a dagesh forte in the kaf. So this one you would almost have to rewrite as chet with the kibbutz and then kaf and then another kaf or another kof, excuse me, another kof with the comments and the hay because there are, there are two kofs there. Uh, I've seen some uh, some grammars where they, rather than rewriting it, sometimes they'll put a diagonal line through the kof to represent the fact that there's kind of a dividing, so the kof has a dual rule there. So that first syllable, would it be open or closed? Mm -hmm. Yes. So the vowel that is underneath the hate, what vowel is that? Not comets, sounds like comets. Kibbutz, yes, and it is a? Almost, U, short U, yep. Uh, and it's allowed to have that because of the dogish forte in the kof that closes that syllable. So this word actually has no open syllables, uh, at least the way that I defied syllables, um, because I, I consider kof Hey, or kof comets hey, a closed syllable. Some of the grammars want to just say that's a kof for the long vowel, but that's way too confusing. So you got two consonants in my book, that's a closed syllable. Um, same with if it was uh, kof hirik yod, I still call that in my book, I still call that a closed syllable. You got two consonants with a vowel in the middle, C, V, C, to me that's closed. And otherwise you get in debates over well, is the consonant part of the vowel or is it a separate thing? Or it, I, I don't care, <laughs> just call it closed. If you got two consonants with a vowel in the middle, that's closed. So this would be two closed syllables. Uh, huka, uh, which means statute or rule or precept or something along those lines. Uh, okay, sorry, phone is dinging at me here. Uh, okay, so number four. After the yod. Okay, what is under the yod? Patak, and is that a long or a short vowel? Short vowel. And does, would this have the accent on it? No, because the accent's usually where? Is it at the front or the end? It's usually at the end, yep. So if this is a short, short vowel, what kind of syllable do I need? A closed syllable. So how could I get a closed syllable on number four from the yod and the patak? Is there something there that closes it? 
Yes, a Dagesh Forte in the bait. Now, how do I know that's not a Dagesh Line? It is, so maybe it's a Dagesh Line. So how do I know it's a Dagesh Forte? I need it to close that syllable. Yep. So on this one, you could draw that line through the bait that would tell you that the bait is doubled there and goes with yod patak bait and then bait comments. Yep. Because that bait is closing that syllable. So that's one of those instances where knowing the um, knowing the fact that a short vowel needs a closed syllable tells me this has to be a dagesh forte, not a dagesh line. If it was a comet under the yod, then it would make perfect sense to have a dagesh line in the bait because then it would be starting the next syllable. And typically when a bagadka fat letter starts a syllable, it will have a dagesh line in it, making it a hard syllable. But because we don't have a comet, we have a patak there, then I know that I need the dagesh forte in order to close that out. Okay, so I got a line through the bait. Where is the next dividing line? Okay, if I put it after the shin, what does that leave me with? What would be left? Mm -hmm. It would be just a hay, and I can't have just a hay. So the line would need to go before the shin so that I have shin, comets, hay together in a syllable. Otherwise, I, ha I can't have, I can't have uh, consonants without syllables, or consonants without vowels. I need, I need every, every consonant has to pair with a vowel within that same syllable. How are you breaking up things that it's only two syllables? Uh, sort of. So you would have uh, yod, patak, bait as syllable one, Bait comets as syllable two, and then shin comets hey as syllable three. Okay. So you the first syllable would be a closed syllable, consonant vowel consonant. Second syllable would be an open syllable because that's a long a, a comets. And then the last syllable, because it has the accent, ends up being a closed syllable, even though it has the comets. Yabasha. Could then because it ends in a, yep, so that would, that would close it. Yeah, uh, Van Pelt, he, he's not always consistent. There's a couple of places where he seems to consider a comet's hay as an unchangeably long vowel, and yet there's other places where he seems to act as though the consonant is closing the syllable. And I suppose that's debatable. That's something for people who write grammars to debate about. Okay, number five. This is a tricky one. I don't know, let me see. I don't think we talked about, I think we actually talk about it next week. So this isn't really a fair question, but we'll try it anyway. So where would you divide number five? You would divide it after the cough, but then when you look at it, what's under the cough? Mm -hmm. Patak, which is a short A. So this is kind of surprising that you would have this. This is why it's kind of an unfair question because he hasn't gotten to this point yet, but in a, um, in, when you have two shvas that show up next to each other, one of them typically disappears. Um, so it, it's odd because the, the rule says you cannot have two shvas in a row. And yet there's a pronunciation rule for what happens when you have two schwas in a row. <laughs> so you're not supposed to, but it happens all the time. So the way that you avoid this is that typically what will happen is that a, uh, when the two schwas are next to each other, the first schwa becomes a hirik. 
Gutturals, though, mess the whole thing up because gutturals do not take just a simple schwa. They always take a compound schwa because gutturals are special. So they have their own category. And so rather than taking a heric, that schwa becomes the vowel of the compound schwa. So the ka on the front, the kaf there, is actually a preposition um, that is that means like or as. And uh, so this is uh, as which or just as or just as which or is, the, is the whole word. Um, but the, the, the kaf there uh, had originally just had a schwa underneath and the two schwas hit each other and the first schwa became a patak. Now you look at this and this is, you look at that and you're like, but we haven't learned that rule. There is a way though to figure this out, and that is that we know that schwas end up in their own syllables. So if we start in the middle of the word rather than the beginning of the word, we see that aleph here has a compound schwa underneath it. And we know that there will be nothing else in that syllable. Because a letter with a compound schwa acts like a syllable. So we could draw a line before the aleph and a line after the aleph. And then we're kind of left with, well, I don't really understand why this cough has a patak in it, but there's really no other way to do this. You can't put a dagesh forte into a guttural. So this, this wouldn't be two alephs. And even if you did try to put a dagesh into the aleph, the aleph rejects the dagesh, remember, and the dagesh makes the patak become a comments. So there is no other explanation here other than there must be something we're not aware of that allows this to be a cough. And it ends up being that bizarre rule about schwas. So even if you didn't know that rule, which you won't learn till next week, so you obviously don't know that, uh, even if you didn't know that rule, you could be able to look at this word and still divide it up simply based on where the schwa is. Aleph has a compound schwa, put a line before, a line after, and see what you have left. And in this case, once you do that, you're actually done dividing the word because there's no other dividing that needs to take place. So in most circumstances, you would not have first letter with a short vowel in a closed or in an open syllable. In this case, you do just because it's difficult. And this, unfortunately, is one of the frustrating things about gutturals. If, if we got rid of gutturals, we could probably finish this class in about two thirds the time that it's going to take us because we're going to spend the last third of the semester basically talking about all the exceptions that are caused by gutturals because they just make life difficult uh, and frustrating. Um, the one comforting thing I would tell you is that eventually you will get to the point where you will almost kind of ignore the vowels because you'll look at the word and you'll just know what the word is. And so you won't really spend all this time trying to figure out, huh, I wonder why that vowel is like that. Unless you're a dork like me who really wants to know those things, you'll just look at the word and you'll be like, I know what the word is, so I'm going to move on. Uh, similar to when, um, you know, when you read the word naive in a book, I don't know how many of us stop and think, huh, I wonder why there's two dots over the I. That's weird. I, I should go look that up. Most of us are just like, word's naive. I know what that word means. I'm just going to keep going. We just keep reading. We don't really think about it. Uh, and I, I don't think that most people pause and, and debate, you know, is that a, a diuresis? Is that an umlaut? Is that a, what do you call that thing? Uh, it's two dots. It's the it, word means naive. I don't care. I'm reading a book not a dictionary. It will eventually get the same place with Hebrew. Unfortunately, as we're starting with Hebrew, elementary Hebrew, we kind of go through all the nitty gritty details here at the beginning. So you'll get to the point where you'll look at that word you make a share that just means just as, and I don't really care why it has the vowels it does. It's just, that is what it is. Move on. Um, there's, a, there's a word in Hebrew that means happiness or, or blessedness. It's the word ashray. And it's a very unique form. Uh, it's at the beginning of Psalm 1, blessed is the man who, ashrei haish. Uh, and it shows up several places throughout the book of Psalms, 
Uh, it's such a unique form though, but it's such a well-known unique form that oftentimes in a, in a seminary level class on the book of Psalms, when the professor asks, what's the form of that word, he just gets dead silence because nobody has paid enough attention to the fact that it's a different form. Everybody knows the word because the word only shows up in that form. And so we all learn it in our vocabulary lessons as ashray without ever thinking of what form it is. It's just ashray. That's just the word. And we spent almost, I think, 45 minutes to an hour of one of my classes debating what the form was and why that was important. Uh, and it, it is somewhat important, but not so much that you really pay attention to it. Most of us just read it because it's a vocabulary word. Uh, and so you know, let that be an encouragement for you that some of these things that seem kind of like, oh, I'm never going to remember this. That's probably true. You're never going to remember this, but that's really not that big of an issue. It's not, it's just something you'll get used to seeing. And, you know, if you can't remember why it's there and it really bothers you, you can go back and look at your class notes. But for the most part, you're just going to get used to it. Okay, number six. Sarah, you seem like you have a question. How do you pronounce the name? Uh, share. And I am a little fuzzy on my uh, segles and say rays when they come at the end of the word. So it's more of a ka'a, ka'a share. I see, I can't even say it. It comes out more as ka'a share, like I'm sharing something, but it's a short E, so it should be more of a share. share. I can't even, yeah, like sherry. Yeah, I, I can't even say it. So ka'a share. And I pronounce all of my compound schwa's as a. Uh. Um, so if you want to be, you know, ka'a, ka'a, I can't even do it. Ka'a, ka'a, ka'a share. But then it just sounds like you're tongue tied. So, kosher. Okay, number six. Where do we put the first division line? After the mem. Okay, if we put it after the mem, what do we have in the first syllable? In that first mem? What's under the mem? Uh huh. And is that a long vowel or a short vowel? Short. So can I have a short vowel in an open syllable? Nope. So where would the line have to go? After the lamed. Very good. So is this a vocal schwa or a silent schwa? Silent. So not mila, but mil or mil. Uh, and then the second dividing line, where would I put that? Mm -hmm. After the hate, what is the vowel underneath the hate? Uh huh. And a comet is a long A. Very good. And then the third syllable ends up being. Yep, closed. Mem, comet's hey. Yep. So this is milchama, which um, I th think is like your. Um, I think it's like vocab lesson five or six that, that you'll have this word. It means uh, war or battle. Lacham means to fight. So this is, a, this is a battle. Oftentimes when we make nouns out of verbs, we just add a mem on the front. Okay. Number seven. Uh, okay, if I go after the Aleph, then what does that leave? Uh, it leaves the Vav by itself. Is that a Vav or is that a vowel? It's a vowel. Yep, and I can't have vowels by themselves. So what letter does the vowel go with? The Aleph. So I wouldn't have the dividing line between the Aleph and the Shurik. I would have it between the Aleph and the Resh, yep. And the other clue is I've got what under the Resh? The Schwa, and it's the first letter of the word, so is it a vocal Schwa or a silent Schwa? Vocal, and vocal Schwas are always by themselves. So put the dividing line after the Resh, so this is Ra, and then U, 
And then what's left? Main. Yep. Yep. So this is what name? Ruben. Yep. Ruben. Uh, and my mind just blanked as to what Ruben's name means. Um, it is a good sandwich. <laughs> Um, no, that is, uh, that's Ruach. They're close. Um, yeah, my mind is, I'm drawing a complete blank here. I just read this the other day. Um, I, I know it's something disturbing because it's his, it's, uh, huh. Yeah, I can't think what it is. Because it, it's uh, Rachel and, and Leah and they're, and they're having their little tiff between each other. And, um, Yeah, and so she names him Reuben, which sounds like whatever the verb is that she took it from. But I here behold a son. Oh, okay. Behold, son. Sure. So this would be from uh, Ra'a, which is Resh, Resh, Aleph, Hey, and but this is more of a participial form. So uh, to behold or to see to see a son or oh see a son but the hay as you'll learn later is kind of chicken so anytime it can leave it will uh, and it leaves no trace behind so and then you learned the word ben for tonight so reuben is see a son thank you okay number eight Where do we put the dividing line? There is none. Very good. What if I put it after the chait? Uh huh. And what do yod and kof, uh, kof not have? There's no vowel, right? So we need the vowel, but if I put it after the yod, then kof is left without a vowel. So they all go together. Uh, so this is, it looks like three consonants, but the yod is with the seire, seire yod, which is a consonant. It's one of those uh, mater lectionis that's helping lengthen that vowel. Um, and because it's a single syllable word, all the accent rules are kind of out the window and you can have any kind of vowel you want because it's only one syllable. Because you could claim it's the syllable, you know, the tone syllable, or you could claim there is no tone. So it's a unaccented syllable because it's just, one uh, and we kind of do the same even in English we kind of do whatever we want with one syllable words when it comes to our vowels uh, uh -huh. oh yeah we it's Bane Ben yeah it kind of comes out the same yeah so it would technically be ra -u, ra -u vein. Uh and when we We've transliterated everything from Hebrew into English, but we've run it most of it through Latin first. Um, so like today you learn Moses, which is Moshe. Um, Solomon is Shlomo. Rebecca is Rivka. Um, Elizabeth might be one of the few that's actually sounds, you know, Elizabeth is, you know, about as, as close as we come. Um, most of the names, because we've run them through other languages between Hebrew and English, we haven't really transliterated them over directly. Um, and some of them, we change the vocabulary altogether. So Ecclesiastes is the Hebrew word uh, is Koheleth, which comes from the Hebrew word to assemble, Kahal. And uh, in Latin and in Greek, an assembly is an ecclesia, so Ecclesiastes is the kind of the assembly, the assembling or the assemblyman or the churchman or so we've run it from Hebrew into Latin into English and we get Ecclesiastes from Koheleth, which makes tons of sense. Yeah. 
it would be labeled Koheleth. Yep. Yep. So there it's different. And even sometimes, um, like uh, if you look on that little paper that I gave you last week, if you still have it, it says the beginning Bareshit. Because typically in Hebrew, the, the first, uh, first word generally is the name of the book, unless there's another one specified. So the book of Numbers is Bamidbar in the desert. Um, that, that's not the first word of Numbers, but that is the word that they chose to name the book. Uh, so we have kind of gotten creative with how we bring names over into English, either having run them through Latin or Greek first, or in some cases attempting to bring them directly over from Hebrew, and it just doesn't go very well. So numbers means in the desert? Uh, well, numbers we, is a name that, that got picked really by the Latin fathers. They picked that name because there were all sorts of numbers in the book. Um, but the word Bamidbar means in the desert. So it has a different name in Hebrew than it does in, in English or even in Latin. So pretty much everybody knows it as numbers, but we, we don't. Uh, in fact, to some degree, uh, there are, well, even the fact that we have chapters in our Bibles, uh, if, if, you're, if you're ever listening to a, somebody who's uh, a, a Jewish uh, cantillator or somebody who's reading the text, they will not refer to it by uh, chapter, they will often refer to it by, uh, there's a letter about halfway down on the text, there's a letter P, and they'll refer to it by the, um, and it escapes me what these mean, there's a P and there's also a Samic that shows up. And so they'll refer to it as, you know, Barre sheet, whatever the S is, uh, Sof, uh, you know, Sof one, Sof Achad, Pay achad, verse one, and then they'll read it. So they, you know, the, the chapter divisions don't always mean anything to them. Uh, and even when they do have chapters, they don't always follow what our English Bible follows. So in our English Bibles, Malachi has four chapters. In Hebrew, it has three, because chapter four is the second half of the original Hebrew chapter three but we've divided it into four. So the, the chapter divisions are not, not inspired. Um, that's something that we added in, added in later. Um, just one of those odd things. So uh, Ruvain becomes uh, Reuben. Um, uh, I'm trying to think what's another. Benjamin, Benjamin becomes Benjamin. Um, uh, Yoseaf becomes Joseph. So we, they're close. You can kind of tell what they are, but, you know, Moshe, Moses, like, well, where'd the, you know, where'd the other S come from? Shlomo. That's, I think that one's my favorite. Shlomo. Mm hmm. Yep. Shlomo. Yep. Yep. Shlomo. Yeah. All right. So number uh, number eight. Uh, no, excuse me. Number nine. Uh, that is also a type of statute. It's similar to number three. You can actually see very similar to the root there. So you've got the hate and the and the kof. The hate and the kof. Just the vowel has changed a little bit. So heik huka depending on uh, what book it shows up in. It might be one or the other. Sometimes they're used interchangeably within the same book. Uh, okay, number nine. Where would we put our first syllable line? If we have it after the Aleph, where's the vowel? After the Shurik, yep because we have to have consonant, at least consonant vowel. So when you're dividing these, Mari, you wanna ask yourself, okay, if I divide it here, then where's my vowel? Do I have consonant vowel or consonant vowel consonant? Can't just have consonant, can't just have vowel. Consonant vowel consonant or consonant vowel? So here with, uh, with the Aleph and the Shurik, I have consonant vowel. So is this open or closed? 
Open, yep. Which means is Shurik a long U or a short U? Long, because the long vowels prefer the open consonants. Very good. And then the, where is my next syllable line? Yes, yep. And what does the Yod have? Has the Dagesh Forte, yep. So this was is playing double duty. So Resh Hirik Yod is my middle syllable. And then Yod Comets Hey is my last syllable. It is a doggish forte. How do I know it's not a doggish line? Yep. So it has to be a forte that's doubling the letter. Yep. And I also know that my hiric underneath the resh is that a long or a short? Short. Yep. And this is not the accent syllable. So this is going to be a it's gonna, it can't be an, an open syllable, it has to be a closed syllable. So that's why I need the yod there. So is it short? Is that a short vowel because it's closed? Uh, no, the yod lengthens it. So yod is one of those weird letters that, that uh, if it was any other letter than yod, then it would, it would not really, uh, it would be a closed syllable with a short vowel with Hirik Yod becomes really blurry because uh, Hirik Yod is uh, oftentimes what we call a diphthong, uh, similar to AY or AW, OW in English of, you know, is OW a, a vowel and a consonant or a vowel by itself or, well, it's a diphthong. So they kind of combine. So you could make the argument that it's a vowel with a Yod but you could also just say that is the diphthong. So it becomes its own, its own thing. This is where sometimes our rules don't really deal with some of the nuance of language. Similar to A-Y in English, you know, play, P-L-A-Y. Is Y a consonant there or is Y part of the vowel? Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of what you're left with. So it's kind of the same thing of, is it a short vowel with a consonant yod or a long vowel because it's hiric yod? Either one. So how would you pronounce that? Uh, this, well, why don't you tell me? How, how would you pronounce it? Well, why don't you? <laughs> <laughs> I thought I had a video, but I don't know. Yes, well, why don't you go, why don't you give it a shot? It just feels wrong that we start with two. Uh-huh, yes, it does sound wrong, but it's not. Yep. <laughs> Uh huh. Uriah. Yeah. And this would be what name? Uriah. Uriah the Hittite. Yep. And if I remember rightly, there's actually two different ways to spell his name. This is one of them. Okay. Uh, number 10. <coughs> Where would be my first dividing line? Mm -hmm. After the shin, because we have a, what kind of schwa? Vocal schwa, yep, so dividing line there. And then what is my next syllable? After the shurik, yep. And that leaves me with I in comments hey. Okay, number 11. Where's my first dividing line? Yep, after the aleph, because that's got a compound schwa and compound schwa's, vocal schwa's end up in their own syllables. And then what's my next dividing line? Okay, if it's after the nun, then what kind of syllable would that be? Open or closed, if it's just nun and a vowel be open, okay, and um, do, um, this is really an exception to a rule, but does, uh, does, does the patak like to be in open syllables? 
You're correct. Yes, this is uh, this is one of the. You're a little too smart. This is one of those places where it is uh, it is kind of an exception. Um, the word is anachnu, and uh, instead of anachanu, um, it just comes out as anachnu. Um, so yes, if you didn't know what this word was, then you are right. You would divide it after the noon. Um, this is one of those cruel words that he's thrown in here. This is my, my one frustration with uh, Van Pelt and Pratico. Uh, I have friends who know Van Pelt, so I blame, blame everything on Pratico. But there's a couple of examples that he gives, and it's like, I know that you copied and pasted that from somewhere in the text without thinking about it. But yeah, if we were going to divide this simply based on what we know, we would say that it is a vocal schwa under the hate, and that it is a, uh, a divided after the... Uh, after the noon there because of the accent. So we'll go with that pretend we don't know what the word was. And then the last syllable would be new. Yes. So uh nah nu. No. And uh yeah th this is a a this is a weird one and a lot of it has to do with the fact that um the the new is a uh, is an ending that kind of rejects the 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 accent in a sense, and so it forces it a syllable back, which is why this ends up being a little bit of an exception. Um, so I'm guessing because this is lesson three, I'm guessing he just assumed nobody would know what the word was and they would divide it the way they're supposed to, uh, like Amaria said. Um, so it's not the way it's divided, but for this lesson, it's the way it should be divided. It's technically a nach nu. Uh, a nach nu. But because of our rules that we've learned, it would be a nach nu. It is. It, uh, it is uh, we or us. A nach nu. Okay. So, number 12, where would my first dividing line be? After Tav, yes, because I've got a vocal schwa there. And then my second syllable. Okay, but that would leave a hyric then in what kind of syllable? Open doesn't like that. So how can I close that syllable? Yep, Dagish Forte in the Lamed. Yep, so that would close out that syllable. Uh, the first syllable with the Tav is a Dagish Line because that's a Begad Kafat letter. The Pe does not have a Dagish Line because that's not really a full vowel under the Tav. So it's kind of acting like there isn't a vowel under the Tav, because it's it's kind of a filler. So that messes with the Dagesh Line rules. So instead of Tafila, this becomes Tafila. Or Tafila, I suppose, technically. And then, uh, so the Lamed, first Lamed goes with the Pei, and then the second Lamed goes with the Comets and the Hay. Uh, prayer. Uh, okay, uh, number 13. Where do we put our first line? After the first hold involved, yep, because that gives us a long vowel in a open syllable, which is what we want. And if we put it after the resh, then my last syllable would start with a vowel. Um, th this is a, uh, holam vav is a tricky one. I got caught up the other day. I was reading in uh, Genesis and um, I can't even remember what the word was, but there was a word where I looked at it and I thought that word just doesn't sound right. There's just something that I'm missing. And within the Hebrew text, you'll notice that the 
holum for the holum vav is directly over the vav. And in this particular word, it almost looked like a typo. It was moved ever so slightly to the right so that it looked closer to the tav than to the vav. So instead of being to, it was tov. And the vav was actually pronounced as a v. And once I realized that, then I figured out what the word was. But it, it took me a couple minutes because it just it didn't, it didn't look right. Uh, so sometimes, even as we're reading, our eyes can kind of play tricks on us of, oh, I know, I know what that is. That's a, that's a whole above. And most of the time, yes. Uh, but every so often, the Masoretes like to be tricky and throw in a vav that's a consonant. So in this case, these are both vowels. Um, tav, holom vav, and then the last syllable ends up being the resh, holom vav, tav. If we divide it after the resh, then we start with a consonant. We can't have that. Uh, and lest we think that this is a vav with a holom and a tav, because that holum is right over the vav, we know it's holum vav. It would be either to the right of the vav or to the left of the vav. So we'd have to kind of pay a little bit of attention to it uh, to figure out where it is. Okay, number 14. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep, you divide the tav. Um, this one is, uh, <laughs> this is a, a, um, this is, uh, this is a unique word in that the ta, the, the dagesh in the tav is not really another tav, but it kind of is, we'll just pretend it is. Um, this is actually a, it's a kind of an odd form that you get when you add a bunch of prepositions together. So this is the, the preposition having to do with in the, like in the midst of something and also the word from, which is mem, hirik, nun. And so the, the dagesh is actually the nun that has gone into the tav. Uh, it has the same effect. It still hardens it, still makes it a t sound, it still closes the syllable. But if you were doing this on a quiz, I would just expect you to divide the tav or write down two tavs. I wouldn't expect you to actually remember that it's not a tav. Um, so again, another one of those times where he's thrown in a word that that you haven't seen yet. So yeah, you would divide the tav, and you would end up with uh, with two syllables, two closed syllables. Okay, number fifteen. Mm hmm Yep. How come we're allowed to have a, uh, a short uh, patak, a short A in that first syllable? Mm hmm Yep. And then what comes next? Uh-huh. Yep, because the schwa would end up being in its own own category. And then Lamed Kamate at the end. We know that it's not Lamed Yod with a uh, silent schwa because it's the accent syllable. Because that would that would throw off the short vowel. It would want a long vowel if it was a closed syllable. So this is one of those words that because we know our syllable rules, we know that it has to be divided after the lamed and before the, shwa, the yod with the schwa because of what we know about preference of vowels and such. Okay, number 16. Where's my first line? After the lamed, yep, the lamed and the vocal schwa. And then my second line, after the mem, again, same thing. We've got a short vowel, but it's the accent. So that's okay. 
And then we've got the ayin with the patak and the nun at the end, which normally we wouldn't have. We would have a long vowel there, but because this is not the accent vowel or syllable, the accent has shifted one to the right, we now still have an unaccented closed syllable, which is allowed. Okay, number 17. Mari, where would my first line go? Very good, after the tzade, because that is what kind of vowel? A short vowel, and it doesn't like an open syllable, it likes closed syllables. So the tzade with the silent schwa there is closing that syllable. Also helps that it's a vocab word, so you know it's mitz. And then what's the next syllable? After the resh, yep, again, patak, short A, but it's an accent syllable. And then the yod hirik mem. This is not hirik yod mem, so it's not im. This is yod hirik mem, yim, or yim. So mitz ra yim, which was Egypt. Okay, number uh, number 18. Where's my first dividing line go? After the top, yes. Same thing as the one as number uh, 17. This is a short vowel in a closed syllable. Why is there a dagesh in the pay? It is a bagad kafet. Uh, yeah, sort of, kinda. It is. We'll call it a line. This is a uh, this this particular form is called a hitpael, um, which is actually what the word is hitpael, uh, and the it requires that there be a dagesh in the middle letter. Um, you know, actually, I take it back. The dagesh in the middle letter is in the lamed, so yes, that would definitely be a dagesh line. The Dagesh in the Lamed is the one that's required by the form because it's the middle letter of the three. The Pe, Lamed, Lamed. A hit palel requires that you have a Dagesh in the middle consonant. So, which we won't get to hit palels till like the last week of August. So don't worry too much about that one. But they're really easy to, uh, to recognize because they always start with hit. They're the only words that consistently start with hit. All the other verb forms are just vowel based. Hit palales actually add consonants onto the front, which makes them very easy to identify. Uh, so we've got a, uh, a short vowel, a patak under the pay, uh, which is being closed by that dagesh line in the lamed. And then we've got the long sere, which is a long e in the last syllable, which is okay, because that's the accent syllable. Hit palel. Yes, yep. Okay, number 19. Where's my first line? After the second mem? After the first mem, yep. Because we've got a schwa there and a schwa fills up one of those syllable blocks. So even though it's technically a little less than a syllable, it's, it still has to be by itself. So mem, and is that a vocal schwa or a silent schwa? Vocal, because it's at the beginning of the word, yep. And then where's my second line go? You'd split the lamed in half, yes. So one half of the lamed goes with the, or one of the lamed, not half, but one of the lamed's goes with the first, the second mem and the patak. So is this a silent schwa or a vocal schwa? Silent, yep, because it's closing out uh, that syllable. Actually, I take that back. Nope, I gotta look at my own rules here. 
This is rule letter D in your how to pronounce Hebrew shva. A is after a long unaccented vowel. B is at the beginning of a word. C is if it's the second of two consecutive shvas. And D is if it's under a dagesh forte, which this one is. So the uh, it looks like it's closing out the syllable because it is closing the syllable, but there's two of them. So if you wanted to get really technical, we would not pronounce the first lamed, we would pronounce the second one. So this is not uh, mamalot, uh, this is mamalaot. Uh, it's kind of like the, the, the filling things or that which fills or that which is full. Mala means to fill. The mem on the front makes it more of a participle filling. So fillings or fillings up or um, things that are full. Okay, number 20. First line. Uh, it's actually not a mem, but yes. Yes, it looks like a mem, but it is actually a tate. The other T, yep, tate, yep. I have horrible penmanship, so all my tates look like mems. This is pretty, I should have seen that. Isn't that two vowels? Uh, well, you would divide the tate in half because that's a dagash forte. So the tate would go with the first patak under the chait. And then you would have the second tav, or second tate would go with the comets. And then you've got just all these consonants that are kind of helping there. So the aleph is helping out with the, with the seire and the, the tate is closing out the syllable. I'm sorry, I'm looking at 21. We're on, we're on 19, aren't we? No, we're on 20, sorry. I, I jumped ahead. Yeah, look at the say right, no. Uh, yes, 20 also has a quiescent aleph where the aleph goes silent um, and then the, the tab at the end. It's, um, why is there a aleph there? It's just part of the word. Um, this is the word for sin, chatat. Uh, so the, it's a feminine word, which is why it ends in the Tav, um, because women are more sinful than men. What? <laughs> I'm going to get something thrown at me here. Is this the example of this quiescence? Yes, yes, the Aleph there, yep, the Aleph quiesces and just kind of sits there. Yep. Exactly. Very good. Yes. Nice. Uh, nice rebuttal. It just sits there because that's what men do. Very good. Very good. Yes. Yep. Yeah. And number 21, we have the same pattern where the Aleph has quiesced and the, uh, the Tav has been added on to the end. So number 21, where would I divide the syllables? Yep. In the Lamed. Yep, so the Lamed has a dagesh forte in it. It gets divided into, into two. Okay. Um, so 22, again, let's pretend we don't know what the word is. How would we divide that? Uh, and number 22, after the, uh, uh, the first letter is actually a pay. Is that the one? That, yep. Yep, you would divide it after the pay. How do we know whether we know that word or not or know why it happened? Why do we know to divide it after the pay? Mm -hmm. Yep, the compound schwa in the ayin becomes its own syllable or is marked as its own syllable. Uh, and so we just, at a default, we can mark that off and then we end up with the pay by itself. This is another one of those where you ended up with two schwas in a row and they got in a fight and one ended up as patak and one ended up as compound schwa. 
you said the iron with the compound. It is, yep, the iron with the compound schwa. So how do you pronounce it? Uh, you just pronounce the schwa. So pa a maim. So you would kind of pretend that there's nothing there. So pa a. And we have the accent mark over the mame with the patak. So that uh, that allows it to keep that short vowel. Amayim. Okay, 23. Where do I divide it? Mm -hmm. In the tav. Yep. So we've got one tav that goes with the patak under the vav. So is that a silent schwa or a vocal schwa? It's actually vocal, because this would be rule D. When you have a, uh, when you have a Schwa underneath a dagesh forte, you pronounce it. And this is a dagesh forte, not line, uh, because it is doubling in order to cover for the patak at the front. Okay, when the book says that the schwa is silent in following circumstances if the previous vowel is short. Yes, and usually that's true. This kind of overrides it. Okay. So if if it was if there was no um, if there was no dagesh in the tav, then yes, because then the tav would be closing the previous syllable. But we end up having two tavs here because of the dagesh forte. So same as nineteen. Yes. So the first tav is silent. The second the second one is the one that's yeah. So you almost have to think of it with the dogish forte as having two tabs there. The first tab closes the syllable, and if it had a schwa, it would be silent. Uh, so like number 18, there's no dogish forte in the tab. So the tab closes out the, the hay with the hirik. So that is silent, hit. Whereas this, because of that dogish forte, becomes va ta, and you do pronounce it. So the difference between 18 and 23 is just the dagesh forte. Okay, and then where's my next dividing line? Uh, close. If I have it, <coughs> yes, in the middle of the lamed. Yep. So the lamed closes out the patak under the shin, and then lamed patak hate um, there. Yes, yes, I'm sorry. Yes, you'd have one after the Tav, and then, yeah, it's its own thing. Yep, so we kind of divide the Tav in half, Tav, Shva, and then Shin, Patak, Lamed. Okay, number 24. Uh, Vata Shalak. Mm -hmm. uh, four. Vata Shalak. Mm -hmm. And she sent. Okay, twenty four. Uh, yes, although this is another one of those exceptions 
that's yes. So we know that it's a reduced, we know that it's a, you know, reduced power or compound schwa. So we know the mem has to be on its own, but we, when we look at it, we can tell based on the fact that you've got this uh, compound schwa, what letter is in the compound schwa? Uh, yeah, the, not the consonant, but the vowel. What's the vowel next to the schwa? Looks like a comets, but this is actually a comets hatuf. So this is a short O that's in that compound schwa. There is no compound schwa with a comets. Uh, compound schwas always have short vowels. So that's why we have uh, uh, segel schwa, patak schwa, kamet hatuf schwa. But because of that, we know that the kamet that comes before a kamet schwa is also a kamet hatuf. So this is actually a short O under the first mem. But again, it's because of the combination of the schwas here that mess with each other. So we ended up with three syllables, the mem with the kamet hatuf, the ayin with the kamet hatuf shva, and then the mem with the actual comets and the dalit together as a closed syllable at the end. That almost came out more like moamad. Um... Kamets Hatuf, the first one. The mem, it, the first mem has the Kamets Hatuf under it. Is it the Kamets Hatuf? Uh, under the ayin? Yeah. That is a Kamets Hatuf Shva. Oh. Kamets Hatuf is short. Right? Yep, that's a short O. There's mud. <laughs> Don't you just love Hebrew, Sarah? Isn't this great? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yep. And do you know that's a common topic because of has to be short vowel because it comes first syllable before the right because it comes right before the right. yep. Whenever you have a, a anything that looks like a comet followed by the comet hatuf shva or the hatef comets, then it has to be a comet hatuf. Yep. Yep. Because you said usually it's just a comet, but now that oh yeah, almost always. Right. Yep. This is one of the few times when it's not. Uh, one of the, it's one of the reasons in particular why I tend not to use the term uh, hatuf, hatef sagol, hatuf, hata, hatef kamets. I just find it easier just to say compound, kamets shva with kamets hatuf, because then I can remember what the vowel is that's in it. Um, so it's, it's not a, it's not a half kamets the way it's a half segol or a half patak. It is a half half comets. So comets hatuf is already kind of a half comets. This is like a quarter comets because it's a it's a short O. So if you just call them hatuf segol, hatuf, patak, hatuf comets, it makes it sound like that's a normal comets with a schwa, but it's not. It's a comets hatuf with a schwa, which should remind me that then if I see them back to back, then the first one has to be an actual comets hatuf which shows up, I mean, not very often at all. So I don't even know where he found this word. So, yeah. It has something to do with pillars or standings. So I'm guessing it has, it's probably from Exodus when you talk about pillars or the standings or, you know, make this many pillars or something. So he, he probably found it somewhere obscure. So, I've often wondered where he gets his words. As you can tell he copied and pasted them uh, especially in some of the earlier editions of the workbook, there's errors because he copied them right out of the text. 
and sometimes he left some of the punctuation in from when he copied and pasted that wasn't supposed to be there. And you're left looking at it like, what is that? We didn't learn that. Uh, so it, sometimes I just wonder, you know, did he just flipped through until he found a very obscure form. It's like, I'm going to stick that in. That'll be fun. I, I don't know. We'll blame it on Pratico. Um, okay, let's do, um, let's do 26 just for fun. This is one of those skin and levy. Yep. So there is, should be a dagesh forte in the yod. So it would be after, kind of divide the yod in half and put a line after the first yod. Yep. So you would have vav, uh, patak, yod as syllable one, and then yod, vocal schwa as syllable two, and then, then what? Uh, the, Where does that Aleph? the Aleph in this case can stand, it can stand by itself because it comes first. Yep. So it would be after the Nun. Yep. Because then you'd end up with the short vowel in the closed syllable with the Nun with the silent schwa closing out the, closing the syllable there. And then U would be the. Yod Shva. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, let's go ahead and turn to page 13. Now for something completely different. Everybody's head hurt already? Yeah. All right, so what we want to do here is we want to find out, figure out if, uh, is the dagesh a dagesh forte or a dagesh line? So this should be, this should be a little easier. So number two, is that a dagesh forte or a dagesh line? Forte, how do we know it's not a dagesh line? Yes. Not baguette, kafet, very good. Number three, forte or line? Forte, how do we know it's not a line? Mm -hmm. Yep, that is clue number one. What's clue number two? Uh, well, you do need to close off syllables. So that's why it's a forte. It closes off the, the patak. But there's a second clue. It's not a Bagad Kafat letter. Very good. Yes. You look at it and you're like, oh, it's T. That's a Bagad Kafat letter. No, the Bagad Kafat letter is Tav, not Tate. So Tate here does not take a Dagesh Line. Okay, number four. The first Dagesh there in the bait. Line or Forte? Line, yes. And how about in the second one there? Line or Forte? How do you know it's not a forte? Okay, and why else? It's not needed. Yep, because what kind of vowel is that under the bait? It's a long A, so we don't need it to close it. So that's why we can have it be a dagesh line. We don't need a dagesh forte here. Uh, and here, this is one of those instances where they put the little metheg next to the comet, so you know it's a comet. Just in case there's confusion that you might think this is bo team, and that it's a short O, and that it is a dagesh forte, they put the metheg there so that you know for sure it's a comet, so it's a long A. It'd be nice if they always did that, but sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. When it really is desperately needed, they usually have it. 
if it would just be kind of helpful, it's usually missing. <laughs> okay, number five. Line or Forte? Forte. It is a Bagad Kafat letter, but we need it to close off that first syllable. Six. Linear forte. Uh huh. Forte. Yep. Because it's not. It's not bagad kafat. Yep. The k in bagad kafat is a cough. Number seven. First dogesh is a. What's that? And you also need it to close the syllable. Yes. Yep. Yep. Because under six, what is the vowel underneath the hate? Kibitz, which is a short U. Yep, yep. So we needed that to close off the syllable. Number seven, what is the first dog? Sarah, you have a question? Sorry, this is a question. Um, on five, because the accent is over, it's not really a question. Uh-huh. It seems like we've been doing a lot of ones that really have a short A without closing off. Uh-huh. Because they were... Well, not supposed to be this but that's how it is. So how do you right. know it's not one of those, you know, you look at this and you're like, well, it could be, mm -hmm. but then it's so many. Yes, make sense? it does make sense. Yeah, some of it you have to kind of work backwards. Um, this is one of those um, words that end in new, like itanu, anaknu, some of those. They tend to be a little screwy with the accent. Uh, so... This one is not itonu, even though it is a accent syllable. Um, it's a, uh, it is a long A. Some of that just comes from vocabulary of just knowing that it's what it is. Um, you know, my default is always, nah, it's probably not an O, <laughs> until I'm proven otherwise. Um, but yeah, sometimes um, sometimes the the rules are not followed, which is frustrating. Um, if you pick up a, a good commentary, like um, a word biblical commentary, uh, there the content of a word biblical commentary is sometimes a little sketchy, but the grammatical part of it is very good. Um, some of the uh, New International Commentary, the Old Testament, same thing. If you flip through the section where they do their translation, usually down in the footnotes, they'll note all the places where it should have been this and said it was this, and we would have expected this, but you see this, and yeah, it, it ends up not being anywhere neat, at near as neat and pretty as we would like it when we actually see it in the text. Um, you know, when we talk about the infallibility and the, um, uh, inerrancy of scripture, we're not always talking about spelling. Um, you know, the, the Greek of first Peter is significantly different in, uh, in its quality from second Peter. Um, because uh, the, the scribe that Peter was using was apparently better at Greek. Maybe he wrote the first one himself. Maybe that's why it's so bad. Uh, but, you know, the, just the Greek is not the same. And the same with the Hebrew of, of sometimes you have people that just don't, pay attention to the rules. They ignore the rules. The Apostle Paul doesn't like periods. Uh, you know, he just does run on sentences for paragraph after paragraph after paragraph. Um, you know, those are just the intricacies of the text. And uh, so here at the beginning, sometimes it can be a little painful of, oh, there's all these exceptions to the rule. Um, some of it is just, okay, I'm just going to do my best with the rule as I understand it now. And then picking up the, some of the nuance as we, as we move on. So some of it, just the more time you spend in the text and the more vocabulary you learn, then it becomes a little easier. But yeah, you would expect it to be just based on the form. You would expect it to be a short O because it is an accented open syllable. Um, but for whatever reason, this just ends up as it keeps the A, the comments. Um, so number seven, the first line we said was a, did I just say line? I did, the first line. So the first dagesh is a line, very good. And the second one? 
Forte, yes. Uh, number eight. Lean air forte. It is a lean A, yep, because we don't need it to close anything because the syllable before is a schwa. Uh, number nine. Uh, the in number eight, the schwa before it is silent because it is closing out the the patak. So that would be malka rather than malaka. So number nine, is that a vocal schwa or a silent schwa? Yep, because it comes after a short vowel. No doggish is involved here. So mish, mishpat, judgment. And is that a doggish lean or a doggish forte in the pay? Mm -hmm. Yep. Number 10. Yep. Yep, because it's closing out the previous syllable, ata. Number 11. Mm -hmm. Lene, yep, bagad kafat. We sometimes forget the dalad is a bagad kafat letter, but it is. And why there is no, um, well, in some ways this is, I don't know what the noun form is, but normally the, the verb form of devar does have a dogish in the bait. I don't know why there isn't one here. He must have copied it from somewhere that didn't have one, but in most cases I've seen it where uh, devar, especially the noun form or the verb form has a dogish, um, especially because the word devar always shows up in a form of the verb that requires a dogish. So you'll almost always see a dogish in that bait. Uh, number 12. Yep. And uh, which one are you referring to? Which dagesh? Uh, the, the second one. Is the first one a dagesh? No, no, it's a shurik. Very good. Yep. That is a, uh, that is a um, vowel. Yep. Number 13. Forte, yep. 14. Mm -hmm. 15. Forte, very good. All right, any questions on anything that we've covered so far? In 14, uh, it is actually kind of its own thing uh, because it's in the cough and the cough will always have a, either a schwa, I erased it, will either have a schwa or a comets in it. Um, so this is just matok. I think they do that so that you're not confused to think that it's a dalit, so that you always know that it's a, a cough. I'm looking at the wrong page, aren't I? I forget I said that. Uh, yes, it is a vocal schwa in number 14. No, I, no, I'm sorry, no. Yes, the kof uh, with the schwa underneath is a vocal schwa. On the other page, number 14, it is not, if that's helpful at all. Yeah, number page 11, that is not, number 14 is not a vocal schwa. Yeah, of course, of course, yes. No, it helps if I look at the right page. No. Tell by the look on your face. Oh, we are not connecting on this somehow. No. All right, well, if you want to open it back up to Genesis, Genesis chapter one, if you have your Bibles or that printout or it's still in Canvas. So Genesis 1, 1, the first word there was bareshit. What is the dagesh that's in the bait? Aline and the shva that's under the bait, vocal or silent? 
Oh, cool. Very good. Yep. Uh, let's skip over to uh, the next word, bara. Dagesh line, dagesh forte in the bait. Line, good. And then further down, hashamayim. What is the dagesh that's in the shin? Forte, yes, that's part of the definite article. The he plus the platak plus the shin, which I think was, was that in this lesson for today? No, that must be for next week that we talk about uh, the definite article. Um, and then uh, let's drop down to, um, let's drop down to the middle of the next line uh, where it says, uh, Hayata tohu vabohu vahoshek al, that next word, is that a dagesh line or a dagesh forte in the, hey? Line, yep, because there'd be nothing for it to close out. And is that a vocal schwa or a silent schwa underneath? Yep, vocal, yep, so pa-ne. Uh, and then in the next word, is that a silent schwa or a vocal schwa? Vocal, yep, because we always put uh, at the beginning, uh, like rule B. Um, same with the next word, first one's always pronounced. Um, okay, uh, drop down to the, the third line there, uh, all the way to the right. What is the dagesh that's in the mem? Forte, yep because that is uh, doubling the mem, because again, that is a, uh, that is a definite article, the seas. So mayim is uh, waters or seas, and this is the, the waters. The spirit was hovering over the face of the waters. Um, uh, if you go to the end of verse three there, you see vayahi or, this is that form that I wrote on the board, via he. Uh, this is a skinum levy. Uh, they've been nice enough to insert the metheg there right by the uh, vav to remind you that this is its own syllable, va. Uh, and it is a vocal schwa, via he, uh, which, especially within this chapter, and it was, via he or, and there was light. Uh, and since it's a skinum levy, we know that the yod has the vocal schwa, and we also know that there should be a dagesh forte there, but isn't, which is why the vav is allowed to keep its uh, short patak there, the short a. Um, because we see there in number four, we see the exact same form, the vaya, that we get in vaya he, although here it's on a different word, but there we do see the dagesh forte in the yod that we were missing in vayahi. The dagesh is there because it's not a vocal schwa underneath, it's a different letter. So is that a silent schwa or a vocal schwa underneath the resh? Uh, no, this would actually be be vocal. Yep, yep. Which vayar? Well, it's an accent mark. I was just looking at that. I was thinking you could, I suppose, if you wanted to say that the accent mark allows the short a to stay, you could say vayara. Um, vayara, vayara. Almost comes out the same, Bayar, Bayara, Bayar Elohim, Bayar Elohim. Yeah, I lean more towards it being a, uh, even though the form would make you think that it's a, uh, a long because of that accent mark, then you'd end up with the schwa followed by a compound schwa, which doesn't happen very often. Yeah, I suppose that one could go either way, depending on 
on the, uh, if you wanted to be a stickler for the rule, because the rule would say that you've got a uh, patak in an accent syllable, but ya, yeah, um, and that because of that, the yod could keep its short patak, its short a, which would leave the schwa then by itself at the end, not really closing out a syllable, but on its own, ra. Um, it ends up being fairly odd um, because you'd have a vocal schwa followed by a quiescent letter, which is odd. So I'd have to look that one up in a lexicon to be more specific, but. Um, Uh, go down to the beginning of verse five. What, uh, what is that in the Yod? Forte. Yep, Forte. And what is, is that a silent schwa or a vocal schwa under the Kof? Uh, it'd be silent because it's closing out the Kyrick, the short I from the previous previous consonant. So Vayikra or Vayikra. Any questions about anything that we've covered? Okay, well now I'm really gonna put you on the spot. Uh, let's start in verse one, and we will just kind of go around the room and just read one word. So Levi, we'll start with you. You can read the first word there. Mm -hmm. And it's it's more of a ray, ba ray sheet. Mm -hmm. Yep. Sarah? Mm -hmm. Elizabeth? Mm -hmm. You get an easy one. <laughs> Mari? Yeah. Mari. Mm -hmm. Yeah, keep going. Uh, Im, Hashamayim. Mm -hmm. Hashamayim. Yep, very good. Yep, Vai. Yep, so it'd be a vocal schwa underneath the Vav. So you would say both syllables of uh, eight. Yep. Jamie, you want to read the end of the verse? Last word there. I'll give it a shot. All right. Um, Alak, Alex, Aaretz. Yep, yep. And then Levi, beginning of verse two. Mm -hmm. And you would pronounce the, the hay with the comets as a separate syllable. So, va ha aretz. Yep. Sarah? Any way you want? 
Uh, that is actually, it looks like Yahweh, uh, but it's actually, that's actually a verb. At the beginning of verse, uh, verse the second line there in verse two. So that one you can actually just sound out. Mm hmm. Yep. Yeah. And it's, it's almost the, the, the schwa there is, uh, is it's technically its own syllable. So you're right. Hayata. It, it almost comes out more as a, uh, if you say it really fast, almost like hi, Hayata. Yeah. Just cause the, the way they, they kind of, the sounds all slur together. Elizabeth. Uh huh. Mm hmm. Sorry. Mm hmm. Bohoshek. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all pane. Yep, yep. It's a short a, so it's almost more of a uh, all, all. Yep, all pane. Yep. Jamie. Yeah, where are we? Uh, we're in the middle of line two. So ayata tohu vabohu vahoshek al pane. You get the next one with the Atnak. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm still not, I'm not sure where we are. Yeah, that's okay. We're in, uh, in Genesis 1, yeah. verse 2, about, let's see, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 words in from the right. Okay. Varaha? Uh, Varuach. Varuach. Yep, yep. So it ends up being a, because it's a shurik, it ends up being a oo sound. And then that's a, a furtive patak under the he, under the heit. So Varuach. That is the accent mark. Yep, so. Um, instead of varuach, it's varuach. It's just telling you to put the emphasis on the ru. How come it's not like arrow? Uh, yeah, the arrow only shows up in English. So that's what we use in our textbook to tell us those are where the accent is as we're... It's the same function. It is, yep. So that's an actual Hebrew accent mark as opposed to the little caret symbol that we use in English. So you'll, you won't you will see the caret symbol at all in the text. It's just something we put in. Um, the accent marks in Hebrew are based on which syllable gets the tone, but it's also based on where the word is in the sentence. So that's why we don't use Hebrew accent marks in our textbook, because the accent mark will always change depending on where it is in the sentence. So the word before varuach is to home. It has the atnak because it's that middle, the middle of the thought. The first thought, as it were, divides after to home, the deep, upon the face of the deep. And the spirit of God, that's the second thought. If ruach was the end of that first section, then instead of the accent that's under the resh there now, there would be an atnak under the resh. If ruach was at the end of the sentence, there would be a saluk under the resh, telling you that it's the last word of the sentence. If it was, you know, the very first word in the sentence, like vaha'aretz, then you would have that diamond symbol that's over the aleph in vaha'aretz in the first line. It would be over the resh. So depending on where the 
word shows up in the sentence determines what accent mark it has. Uh, the tone syllable of the word will always be the same in, in any given form. It changes based on form, but any given form, um, no matter where you would see uh, varuach in scripture, it will always have the accent on the resh because that's the form. But the actual, what the accent mark looks like changes based on where in the sentence you put it. So that's why we don't put them in our textbook because you could look in your textbook and get used to seeing it with one accent syllable, but then it will show up in scripture with a completely different one, depending on where it is. Because the, the accent marks mark the tone syllable, but they also mark the divisions of the actual sentence, dividing it up into almost thought sections, as it were. Um, and, and a lot of that depends on how many words are in the sentence. So every sentence will have an ot knock. Every sentence will have the saluk in that last word of the sentence. Every sentence, I think with the exception of one in all of scripture ends with the sof pasuk, which is the double diamond thing at the end of the sentence that acts as the period. As for the other accents, a lot of that is dependent on how many words there are in the sentence, how many clauses there are, how many times you need to divide the sentence up because you keep dividing it up into smaller and smaller sections. And so the number of accents you use increases depending on the length of the sentence. But if you have a short sentence, you might end up with only Atnak, Saluk, and the Sof Pasuk at the end. Uh, so the, those accent marks are, are clues for a couple of different things. Yep. Have you found that the way that they divided up their sermons by the text was added in the understanding the meaning of the intent? Sometimes, yeah, there are some instances where there's a word that you think it goes with a different word and you realize, oh, wait a minute, it doesn't go with that. But in English, we don't insert commas unless we feel we need them. And some places in English, it would seem odd to insert a comma to remind you that those two words don't go together. So we don't put a comma because it would just, it would look like somebody didn't know punctuation. Um, but it gives the impression then the two words go together and the accent marks, we might find out that one is before the odd knock and one is after the odd knock. So they don't directly go together. Um, trying to think of an example of, um, hmm. can't think of an example off the top of my head, but there are a couple places where, um, where the, the, the subject that you might think goes with the verb doesn't. And you know that because the accent marks will tell you these two are, are separated. Uh, so the subject of the sentence may seem a little ambiguous in English, but it's clear in Hebrew based on the, just the punctuation, the way you would read it. Um, so is that always the case? No, a lot of times just grammatically you have to have divisions. Uh, but there are times where Yep, it does make a difference. Uh, and I can't give you a percentage of the number of times that that's the case, but there are, there are instances. Any other questions, anything else? Okay, well, reminder that next Tuesday, you have a quiz on vowels. Uh, and again, I am going to give you simply a blank chart from the syllabus. And it will say um, A class, I class, E class, the I class is I and E, but, and then O class, U and O. But it'll have those three columns, A, E, I, O, and U basically divided up, short, long, unchangeably long, I'll give you the consonants, you just gotta add in the vowels. Um, in class? In class, yep. Yep. So that'll be a quiz we actually take in class because I can't figure out how to do it online. Uh, there is vocab for Tuesday, so there is another vocab quiz, and the vocab list with, uh, quiz list is twice as long. Um, so please accept my apologies. There just wasn't a way to divide it up. Uh, so it's 40 words instead of 20. Um, but you have almost twice as long to learn it. So I've tried not to give you 
20, double the words from Tuesday to a Thursday. Try to give you a weekend. Uh, I really have a random question. Yes. So for the gap to fat, uh -huh. is it pH instead of just a B? I have no idea. That was a good question. I don't know. I, yeah, it's one of life's mysteries. I don't know. Yeah. To be consistent, you would expect the GAD capat. Because all the consonants are. Yep. Yeah, I don't know. Somebody was messing with us, I guess. What is the term for using symmetry? It just closes out that previous syllable. And the Masoretes felt that every, every consonant, with the exception of the quiescent letters, Aleph, He, and Yod, needed a mark of some sort. So in English, we don't care. You know, daddy, okay, yeah. We, we don't need to put something on the first or second D. We just know that one D goes with the A, one D goes with the Y. They really thought that every letter needed a mark. And so they marked it with a silent schwa just to note that there was something. Why they couldn't come up with another thing instead of, you know, I got an idea, let's use one we've already used before. I mean, it's the same thing with the comments and the comments hatuf of, You've already got so many symbols. You couldn't come up with just one more. Just one more symbol. It's all you had to come up with. Just one. I, I, I don't know. It doesn't. You know, part of me thinks, you know, oh, well, you know, they were trying to make it easy for the scribes. But then you look at the weird, bizarre um, symbols that they use to tell you to go out to the columns or for the accents. You know, you got a little spy glasses in here at one point. I mean, it's like, yeah, you weren't trying to make it easy for anybody. So why you couldn't just come up with one more symbol? I have no idea. Especially because they're not really basing it on another language. Because other languages don't really write their vowels either. I don't know. I mean, yeah. Arabic kind of marks their letters, but nothing like this. So I, I don't know. Yeah. I wonder if, if there was a, um, some political reason of I'm going to keep parts of it secret or I don't know. 